right, so in this lecture, we're going to talk about how Mendel's genetics relates to chromosomes. So first of all, uh, there's something called the chromosome theory of inheritance. It basically says that genes are located on chromosomes. Mendel, just to, just to clarify, Mendel didn't know about genes, chromosomes, meiosis. He lived in the 1890s, so all of his proposals, even though they were correct, he didn't know about meiosis and chromosomes and all of that. He just said that there were these factors that segregated and underwent independent assortment and, uh, and produced these traits. So we now know these factors are genes. Genes are located on chromosomes. The location of a gene is called its locus. The word loci is plural, and all genes have specific loci on chromosomes. Also, chromosomes are the units that undergo segregation and independent assortment, Mendel's principles. And just a reminder from our meiosis chapter that there are 23 homologous pairs in a human body cell or somatic cell, meaning 46 total chromosomes, but each one has a partner. 22 pairs were called autosomes, and then one pair was called the sex chromosomes, and that was the X and the Y. XX was a female, XY was a male. So a gene is a location on a chromosome, and Again, Mendel's principles, he said there was this process by which the factors separated. We're saying that's meiosis. Meiosis is the process, uh, and the chromosomes are the things that segregate or separate. And independent assortment, if you remember when we were doing like big R, little r, big y, little y, and we were saying, oh, you could get big R with big y, big R with little y, little r with big y, that was independent assortment. What's undergoing independent assortment, what's lining up randomly, is actually the chromosomes. So that's the chromosome theory of inheritance. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is what are called sex-linked traits. So now that we know a little bit about chromosomes, there happen to be some traits that are carried on our sex chromosomes. And this was discovered by Thomas Hunt Morgan, who worked with Drosophila melanogaster, which is the fruit fly. That's its, uh, its scientific name. And it actually worked out well that he worked with fruit flies because they have only four pair of chromosomes, eight chromosomes. They are easy to breed. One female can have lay a hundred eggs after mating with just one male. Uh, they have like a two week life cycle. So there's lots of reasons why working with fruit flies was a really good choice. So what he discovered was occasionally some flies came out with mutations. In fact, I believe they even worked with x-rays. They exposed them to x-rays which actually cause mutations in the DNA. And when a fly would appear with a mutation, he would call that a mutant fly. And the normal ones were called wild type. You should be familiar with that term wild type. It's often used in nature to describe the normal version of a trait that we see in nature. Um, so you'll see wild type a lot, especially in fruit fly crosses. So what he would do is he would take these mutant flies, cross them with the normal ones, uh, wild types, and then see the results so that he could see sort of how these traits were passed on. So a very common one that he did is he crossed a white-eyed male fly, which was a mutant, with a red-eyed or wild type female. Now the offspring in the F1 came out all with red eyes, um, which is what we would expect. If you cross white and red, you get red. That would tell us that red was dominant to white. But when he crossed the F1s and let, let them mate with one another, in the F2, he saw something very strange. All the females had red eyes. We're talking about 1,000 flies, 5, 000, uh, 500 females, all red-eyed, but around 250 males with white eyes, 250 males with red eyes. Half the males white, half red, but only males. So he called this a sex-linked trait, or sometimes we'll see it called an X-linked trait because it's usually on the X. It turns out our Y chromosome only has about maybe two dozen genes, not a lot of genes, and so the Y chromosome, uh, it's very rare that a trait is carried on the Y. I'm not going to say that it can't be, but these common ones are called X-linked or sex-linked, and the way you're going to write it is like this, X in, X in, in being our trait. Um, our females have two X's, and then a male is X in Y. Notice how we put the superscript for the trait on the X showing the trait is carried on the X. Also, biggest mistake people make with these crosses, they want to put a letter on the Y. Remember, the Y is a completely different chromosome. It doesn't have anything in common with the X. So a male only has one X, and as you may be predicting already, this is what makes these traits inherited a little differently. So let me show you 
actually, let me take Mendel's cross and show you what was really happening. So his white-eyed male was actually X little r y because white was recessive. And his red-eyed female was X big r, X big r. Now, how do I know she was homozygous? Because remember, that white-eyed fly was a mutant. That was something weird and rare. So we can pretty much assume all the other flies were homozygous for red eyes. To do a Punnett square, it's the same thing we've done before. You cross your male and your female. Notice how I only wrote the X big R one time. You can write it twice if you want to. You will get the same answer. X big R Y, X little R Y. Guess what? All the flies had red eyes. So that's what was happening there. But when he crossed the F1s, notice what happens. So he's crossing now X big R, X little R. These are his F1s in the box, remember, with X big R, Y. Well, when he crosses this, notice this is what our cross would look like, all of the female flies come out with red eyes because they're all getting at least one copy of big R. So this is our females, all with, all with red eyes. And then our males, notice what happens with our males. 50% red, 50% white. And this is what explains his cross in the males. And we do write our results from these crosses, separating out our males and our females. So let me show you another one, take a little more time on this. So in humans, hemophilia is a sex-linked or X-linked trait. It's recessive. This is a blood clotting disorder. People with hemophilia tend to bleed more easily. Their blood clots more slowly. So a normal female would be, I'm just going to use N, X big N, X big N, or X big N, X little N. Now, um, a a female, actually, it doesn't have to even be a sex link trait, but anytime a trait is recessive, particularly a disease, if it's recessive, you're not going to show it if you're heterozygous. So she's going to look normal, but we do have a word for that. Sometimes instead of calling them heterozygous, we'll call them a carrier because they're carrying the trait, even though they don't show it. They're carrying it, um, and they can pass it on to their offspring. So she's going to be a carrier. To be hemophiliac, she would have to be X little n, X little n. So that would be our, our female that has hemophilia. A normal male would be X big n, Y, and a hemophiliac male would be X little n, Y. Notice again that the males only have one X. So this looks a little different uh, in a female versus a male. So we're going to cross um, two people here, uh, a female carrier, and a normal male. So a carrier, again, be familiar with that word carrier. It means that she doesn't have hemophilia, but she carries a copy of the gene. And again, this would only apply when a trait is recessive, because if you're dominant, you can't be a carrier. If you're dominant, you show it if you have a copy. So a female carrier is gonna be X big N, X little N, and a normal male is gonna be X big N, Y. So neither of these parents uh, phenotypically shows hemophilia. And notice, here are their daughters. Notice how all their uh, female children are normal, right? None of them are little in, little in. But if we look at our male children, half male is normal and a one-half chance um, of a male with hemophilia. So, and this is the way you'd want to report your results. You wouldn't just say three-fourths normal, one-fourth hemophilia. That would be incorrect. That would not be a fair, a fair assessment here. All the females, if they have a girl, her chance of hemophilia is zero. But if they have a boy, it's a 50-50. Now, reasons, uh, so a couple things to notice about this. Let's change this up. Let's say I cross a female that has hemophilia with a normal male. Can she have a girl with hemophilia? And the answer is no, because every girl is going to get a copy from her mom and her dad, and her dad is gonna give X big N. So every girl that she has is gonna get a copy of the good gene, and even though her girls will carry hemophilia, she can't have a girl with hemophilia. Now, what if she has a boy? The answer to that, 100% will have hemophilia. Why? Because the dad gives the Y. 
And that means the only X they're going to get is going to be the X from their mom who has hemophilia. So all the male children would have hemophilia. So this brings us to some conclusions about sex-linked traits. Um, this is actually just a family tree just to show you. This was a, a royal family starting with Greek Queen Victoria and Albert. Notice the squares are males, the circles are females, and the orange color means they have hemophilia. And notice that there's not a single female in this family tree that has hemophilia, only males. Um, and that's a very common thing you'll see in a pedigree or a family tree of a sex-linked recessive trait is that we, we see it almost exclusively in males. And the reason why is because it's so hard to get a female with these traits. In order to get a female, and I didn't say this on the previous slide, but in order to get a female with hemophilia, you would basically have to have a cross like this. You would have to have a male that has hemophilia and a female, his wife, would have to at least be a carrier. So these are not really common traits. Hemophilia, colorblindness, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, these are not common traits in the population. So the chances that you're going to have a male that has it and a female that's carrier of it, it's going to be very low. In fact, one of the reasons it's so high in this royal family tree um, is because there was a lot of marriages between second and third cousins. So, you know, a trait that's maybe not very common in the general population, if it happens to be in your family, it may be common uh, in your family. And the chance if you marry somebody that's related to you, there's a higher chance they may be carrying this gene. So, um, so anyway, so let's talk about conclusions. So sex-linked recessive traits are going to be more common in males. And again, this is because males only have one copy of the X. So if they get a bad copy of the hemophilia gene, they have hemophilia. If a girl gets one bad copy of the hemophilia gene, she's still normal. She needs two copies to have hemophilia. Second, they're always given to males specifically by their mother because fathers give the Y to their sons. So men that have a sex-linked trait, they can pass a copy to their daughters, but they cannot pass it to their sons ever because in order to have a son, they're giving the Y chromosome. So here is a cross. We're going to cross. This is a sex-linked trait in cats. So yellow fur and black fur are carried on the X. And neither one is actually dominant. This is actually an example of like co-dominance. If you are X big E, X little E, you have a pattern called tortoise shell, uh, where there's basically patches of, of uh, brown fur or blackish fur and yellow fur. So they want you to cross a tortoise shell female with a black male. So we're using X big E for yellow and X little e for black. So this is a picture of a tortoise shell cat here. So X big E is yellow. Um, we're using X little e for black. And in this cross, we're crossing a tortoise shell female with a black male. So our tortoise shell female is going to be X big E, X little e. And a black male is going to be X little e, Y. Notice that the male has to be X, Y. I have people that make the mistake and make the male X little e, X little e. That's a female, so that doesn't work. So we get X big E, X little e, X little e, X little e, X big E, Y, X little e, Y. So we're going to report these results separate for the two sexes. So our females are going to be one half tortoise shell and one half little e, little e is black. But our males are actually going to be different. They're going to be one half of the males would be yellow, one half of the males would be black. You actually cannot have a tortoise shell or a calico male cat because since a male only gets one X, he's either going to get black or he's going to get yellow. He's not going to be able to carry both. So all calico and tortoise shell cats are female uh, unless they have some kind of a chromosome disorder. Color blindness, we talked about this a little bit in the lab that we did. This is also a sex-linked trait. And finally, what does the Y chromosome actually do? So it, it only has about two dozen genes. It's a very small chromosome, if you remember from the karyotype. It basically tri triggers male development. Early on, um, there are these, this is uh, basically the reproductive system of an embryo, and there's these gonads. They haven't turned into anything yet. The presence of the Y chromosome basically at, at a certain point triggers the gonads to become testes. If there's no Y chromosome, no trigger, 
they automatically become ovaries.